So, I asked a question on Twitter. I asked a question on Twitter. Here's the question I asked right there. I said to everybody, whoever, it, whoever cares about my Twitter page, I said, for those who went from pro-choice to pro-life, I'm really interested to know what it was that changed your mind. Among all the possible reasons to change your mind, what was it that changed yours personally? Thanks for your answers. Um, now, I often use Twitter not for, I don't like debating on Twitter. I think it's way too cumbersome of a platform for that. But I like to just get people's thoughts, you know, like gather them and look at them. I don't really want to fight them on those issues. Usually on Twitter, um, Twitter is, is, a, is a cesspool when it comes to arguing with people. It, it, it seems to draw out the ugh. But um, I thought that the answers that I got to this tweet were really, really interesting. And so I've gathered eight of them, eight of the people who went from pro choice to pro-life and they gave us their one reason or their number one reason or their pivotal reason like this is the thing that shifted them over from pro-choice to pro-life which is a big change because these two opposite ends really have very different um things that they consider valuable to them you know so it's interesting to see what made them change their minds so we're going to go through these different uh reasons today on the live stream and uh, because this video that you're about to watch, this live stream right now, is going to have some tough parts, I first want to just make you smile. So what I did was I, I picked the nicest, the happiest reason that I was given by the people on Twitter. And here it is. Um, Sherry, and thank you, Twitter people, for answering my question, by the way. There's a whole bunch of them. I linked my Twitter thing in the, in the uh, video description so you can go check out the whole... Uh, conversation there if you'd like. I just picked out eight, eight specific people. Sherry's one of them though and she says, my eight week ultrasound. I didn't see a clump of cells. I saw my child. I wasn't choosing if she would ever live. She was already alive. My choice was to keep her alive or kill her. And this was Sherry's like aha moment for her. This was like, whoa, um, seeing the ultrasound, seeing this caused her to realize something that the barrier of her belly was keeping her from seeing. She saw a bump. Well, the ultrasound let her see a life. And so what I've done is I've actually gathered some clips of some ultrasounds I'd like to share with you guys. And this is actually uplifting. I think everybody, unless you have some kind of agenda against ultrasounds, I think everybody would enjoy and be blessed by this little, um, this little compilation. That's what you do when you sleep. Oh my God. I feel her moving. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh! <laughs> yeah, he has your big nose. She's right there. So just let's. Where? That's her foot going up and down. That's her eye, her nose, her head. That's her nose. And that's her leg going up and down. Look how big the cheeks are. Look at all the pictures we got, you guys. Look how pretty she is. She's so cute. She's a gorgeous. Right there, right there, right there, right there, right there. There we go. Hi. Oh, there it is. That's my son. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> That's really nice. I was like, I don't want it to end. I like watching these. Oh, man. He's like, That's my son. You notice something about these ultrasounds is, is when these people, when they see, you know, through the belly, through the bump, and they see what, what's making the bump, um, everything changes, right? And all of a sudden, they're not like it. Oh, it, look at the fetus. Look at the embryo. Wow, look at that. No, instead they're like, look at her. Look at him. Wow. And it just, the lights go on, right? The lights go on. And for not for everybody. Plenty of people will see an ultrasound and then go have an abortion. But they shouldn't, I think. I think what we're seeing here is something pretty powerful. So uh, I hope that that, maybe that changed your mind. Maybe that's all you need this video for. Your, your mind has changed. And uh, good, because that's what I want to happen. I don't, I'm not trying to manipulate you. I just want to show you what's going on here. Um, so welcome, welcome to the Tuesday live stream. I'm Pastor Mike Winger, and um, I'm all about helping people learn how to think biblically about everything and tackle different issues that touch on the Christian worldview or theology or apologetics. And this is definitely one of those major issues today. And uh, yeah, we do this every Tuesday at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And I'm glad you joined me. I'm glad you joined me. Um, it's all free. All my content's totally free. If you're interested in supporting the ministry, go for it. There's, there's a link below and all that, but just know this. 
The goal here is not to get your support. The goal here is to minister to you and bless you. That's it. Full stop, right? Glorify God, minister to people. That's the goal. And uh, God's providing and we're secure right now, like able to continue plowing forward. I'm not in any sort of financial danger. Anyway, I'm just rejoicing because a year ago, a year ago, I was thinking, I don't know if this is going to work. I don't know if this is going to work. I'm going to be trying to do this full time now. I don't know if this is going to work or will I be looking for a job, you know, in six months. And um, anyway, God's opened the door and I'm going to keep on walking through it. So here we are. Reason number two. Reason number two. This is from Teaser Money. Teaser Money replied to me on Twitter and said, Knowing that the scientific community overwhelmingly agrees that human life begins at conception. That was the thing that changed his mind. He was like, yeah, I can't be pro-choice anymore. You know, he was thinking maybe it wasn't really a human life. He says, from then on, it was easy. I already believed that humans were made in the image of God. And so here he his, he's a Christian and he's, he's, get this, blow your mind. He's allowing his Christian worldview to change how he thinks about the topic of abortion. That's like, a, that's proper Christianity. This is good. This is healthy. We we have this weird thing, and it, I don't know if it's just, it's not just America. I'm sure other countries have this issue too, where we almost feel like we have to like have our Christian worldview and our Christian beliefs like in a bubble separate from the rest of our lives. And I'm, I'm sorry, but it seems to me that you can't do that and follow Jesus at the same time. Like these, you, you can't segregate your Christian beliefs from your business and from your, your work ethic and from your politics and from your, um, your engagement with the culture around you. You can't, you can't do that without separating Jesus and obedience to Jesus from those things as well. So yeah, he lets his Christian view handle this. He just said, yeah, I just didn't, I wasn't sure that the thing was alive when I found out that what was inside of the, of the, of the woman from conception was a living human being that changed everything for me. Well, this is something I shared uh, last week when we talked about this topic from a different angle. And it's a paper from the uh, printed or published by uh, Stephen Andrew Jacobs uh, from the University of Chicago Division of Social Sciences, Department of Comparative Human Development. I thought I'd put the screenshot up here for you. They surveyed over 5,000 biologists from over 1,000 different academic institutions and asked them, when, oh, biologist, oh, smarty pants biology people, oh, microscope addicts, Tell us when life begins. And the overwhelming answer, over 95%, said that biological life, the biological view was that life began at fertilization. Let me show you the quote from the paper. I'll just grab the clip for you. Over 95% of all biologists affirmed the biological view that a human's life begins at fertilization. Human life begins at fertilization. Now, what happened with um, with teaser teaser money was there, or teaser monkey? I'm trying to remember which one it was. There, let's go back and look. Teaser money. All right, with teaser money, what what he did was he said, "Hey, I already have a philosophical view about life, informed by my Christian principles, that human life has incredible value. All I needed to know was that that's a human life. End of end of debate. Okay, biologist, you help me confirm it's a human life, and." My Christian moral worldview tells me that it's wrong to kill it. Um, so yeah, duh. I mean, I don't need a consensus of biologists. I mean, if 95% of biologists said it wasn't human life, I'd be shocked and I'd be like, explain to me why, please. I mean, it's it's alive by any meaningful definition of the word alive. This thing, this little boy or girl. Does it does it have DNA? Yeah, it's got its own DNA, different from the others. It's it's So it's living, it's, it's human. It's got human DNA. It must be human. It's, it's not um, some other creature. Like, does it doesn't become human at some later stage. This is just an early stage of human development. Uh, some people would try to say that it's just sort of like part of the mom. But that's so weird because then the baby in the womb would, being part of the mom, not just connected, but part of the mom, not just connected to mom. This would mean that the mom has two brains, four arms, two spines, four ears, two different sets of DNA. Um, and she's about to split in two at some point. At some point, she turns into two people. No. Um, so I'd be shocked if biologists didn't come to this conclusion. Uh, but I think it's important to realize that that for some people, they're pro-choice because they haven't thought carefully about the fact that what is inside the womb is a human life. That's a pretty big deal. Pretty big deal. Let's go to reason number, th uh, reason number three. Here it is. And I'm going to go to your guys' questions at the end of this stream. So you can put those in the live chat right now. Just put a Q next to it and we'll gather in those questions. And I'll answer as many of them as I can. I try to answer them, some that are on topic when possible. Although I know there's always some that come in that are on other topics. And I'll, I'll do my best to give you the best answer that I have off the top of my head. 
Uh, Josh says this, Josh says, my natural reaction was to be pro-choice. But as I aged, I realized there isn't a good reason to be uh, from a Christian moral standpoint. If human life is sacred, then when that process starts, there isn't a moral reason to stop, to stop it unless the mother's life is in danger. Now, in the last reason, the last person who changed their mind, te teaser money, he said that it was because he already believed human life was sacred and he just needed to know if life had begun at conception. He gets con confirmation for that and he says, okay, pro I'm, I'm pro-life now. Now, for Josh, it was a different reason. He He's having the philosophical question. He's like, I, for some reason, I want to be pro-choice. I have a natural tendency to be pro-choice. And I think a lot of people are like this. They don't think deeply about the issue, which... I understand that's how we usually start with most issues. We just, our gut reaction to them, right? And they just naturally want to be pro-choice. They think pro-choice is feminism or pro-choice is women's rights or pro-choice is da 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 But something happened as Josh thought and matured and grew in his age. He realized there isn't a good reason to be pro-choice from a Christian moral standpoint. So he had an inclination to be pro-choice, but not good reasons. And this might be the case for you. If you ask yourself, I'm pro-choice, but why am I pro-choice? Why? Like, let me think it through. Like, without anger, without demonizing other people, let me just think it through. Why am I pro-choice? And he found he didn't have good moral reasons to do that as a Christian. Because simply, human life is sacred. Human life is sacred. Now, this is where, um, obviously, um, someone who's not a Christian might not feel the same way. And I'll say, well, if you don't think human life is sacred, then, then and this is a really big deal, something's wrong with your morals, your moral compass. If you don't think human life is sacred, human life is sacred, then who, who is it okay to kill? Everybody? Anybody? Um, this is a, this is, ultimately that is a manifestation, thinking that human life itself is not sacred, not having incredible value, is a manifestation of a rebellion against God, of a heart that has turned from its creator, and that is, is becoming calloused or enable, unable to sense moral truth. And there's a whole other issue going on there. But I'd like to share with you some of the biblical basis for this. And it's in uh, Genesis chapter 9, verse 5. This is where after the flood, God gives a command, not just to the Jews, not just in the law of Moses, to the, to the Hebrews or to the Jewish people, but rather he gives it to all mankind. He says, and for your lifeblood, I will require a reckoning. From every beast, I will require it and from man. From his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of man. In other words, you kill someone, you're, you're going to be in trouble. And then verse six, whoever sheds the blood of man by man shall his blood be shed for God made man in his own image. There's what happens. You kill, you get the death penalty. That's a divine prerogative. God's establishing that he's assigning because he only has the right to take life. But he says, hey, humans, you can require blood at blood. You know, murder gets the death penalty. And then there's a whole other debate on that. But I think that's what scripture seems to just plainly teach. But there's a reason for it. It's because God is made in man, uh, man is made in God's image. God has made us in his image. I'm in God's image. Now that, that nature of being in the image of God elevates me above all other animals. I'm not like an intelligent monkey. There's something qualitatively different about a human being that goes beyond just us being more advanced. Rather, we're in God's image. There's something of the, the immeasurable value of the creator that he has placed upon us. And so human value, human life, that impulse that humans have value, incredible, immeasurable value, that that is a divine, divinely given impulse. That's true. It's a true thing. So this is what it, what changed it for, um, for Josh. It was when he realized, hey, human life is sacred. Human life is sacred. Now I want to respond real quick to a possible objection on this one. Um, some people would say, but, but Mike, um, doesn't, doesn't that just limit it to blood? It says bloodshed and people want to, sometimes they want to take the Bible, not, not, uh, not just literally, but with like a wooden literalism that was like not meant to be read, read with. And so they'll say, Hey, this means that, um, that as long as you know, you're not shedding blood, it's not really killing. You could argue this. Okay. Cause it says if, if he sheds blood. And so babies, if they're not, if they don't have blood yet, you're not shedding their blood, then technically you're not killing them. Now, this is a strange argument because this argument isn't an argument that you can kill babies at a certain age. It's rather an argument that babies aren't alive at that age. Do you see the difference? Right? They're, they're not alive because life and blood are somehow int in intricately connected. Um, so uh, first thing, let me just say this. 
um, blood represents life. It doesn't, it's not like the beginning point of life. That's not what the scripture is saying. It, it's representative of life. This is why it's used in the Old Testament in the in Levitical sacrificial system. They would take the blood and sprinkle it as a representation of the life of the animal being offered to God. This is a representation. That's what it would take. We're, we're cleansed by the blood of Christ. It's, rep it's representative of his life being given to us. He gave his life to us. So it's a representational thing. It's not a beginning point of life. That's not what uh, the scripture is clearly teaching here. No. Um, now, if, if you did take it that way, if, if life begins when blood first forms, well, that's three weeks in. That's like day 21. Most people don't really know they're pregnant until after this point. And so if you're going to argue this way and, and be, I think, a problematic Bible interpreter, uh, then you're going to have to argue that all abortions after the 21st day are murder. That would be the consistent view that you would have to have. Think about that. Think about that. Now, I'll say that's also not what scripture is teaching. So just to kind of push you on what follows if you hold that view. I remember, though, this this angle of just saying, hey, let me just let me just say God says, you know, Human life is valuable, don't murder. Like, that's the whole argument. I remember having a long argument with a family member about this. And they talked about, like, you know, what about abortion rates? And what about wire hangers and back alley abortions? And, and what about uh, women who aren't ready to have a kid and, and kids born into poverty? And all these kinds of questions. And we had a long discussion about it. It was, it was, it was intense, but it wasn't angry, right? It was just, like, heavy. A heavy talk, but it wasn't angry. But at the end of it, I realized that none of the arguments I had mattered. Like they would ask a question like, what about back alley abortions? And I was like, well, you know, when you, you know, this is, this is not justified to kill one person, to, you know, in order to prevent someone from dying while trying to kill that person, right? That doesn't make sense. It's not justified. I would give these kinds of answers. Uh, what about rape? Well, you don't, you don't kill the child for the sins of the father. We don't kill the, you know, the child for the father having committed a rape, do we? Um, we don't do that. And I would say, oh, what about a one-year-old? Could you kill a one-year-old after because the father committed rape? No, of course not. And they would offer all these types of things. Um, well, finally, at the end of the conversation, I just got to the point where I, I just, I realized there's, there's nothing I can say that matters. I answer these questions with good answers, but the person doesn't care. And so I said to them, thou shalt not murder. And they said, well, what about rape again? And I said, well, you shall not murder. And then they asked another question. They said, but you shall not murder. And I became this broken record, probably annoying to some people. You shall not murder. You shall not murder. You shall not murder. And this person would proclaim they believe in God and believe the Bible. And so it was years later, the next time abortion came up with that family member, whom I love and care about. And when abortion came up with that person, it didn't come up with me and them. It came up with them and another family member. And that family member said something about abortion. And I, I kid you not, this person I love turned to them and said, Thou shalt not murder. And it was just, you see, sometimes with abortion, we have calluses built up in our heart against the obvious truth of the issue. And sometimes the stripping away of the callus is simply the proclamation that you don't kill people. That's just it. You shall not murder. And so that made a difference for at least that person and others have felt the same thing. Uh, let's look at reason number four. Numero cuatro. This is from Sirius Supernova. She says, the fact, what changed her mind, was the fact that all the choice is decided by one person, when in reality, there are two people involved. This was the big revelation for her. And what's, what's cool about this is I actually talked about this in last week's live stream where we talked about abortion. And, and actually a, a pro-choice artist who drew some images about Jesus supporting abortion, I asked her some questions privately about it and she blocked me online. And um, then we discussed that, the image and the propaganda of the movement. And what we find in the propaganda of the pro-choice movement is to constantly forget that there's a child involved. Not just forget, excuse me, to purposely cover up the fact that there is a second individual involved. It's not just the mother. It's also the child or the baby or the infant or the fetus or whatever term you want to use to talk about this living human being inside that belly. Well... This is what changed it for Sirius Supernova. She said, I realize that all these pro-choice arguments fall apart when you realize that you don't have a choice to kill other people. Like you don't, it doesn't matter how much freedom of choice you have, it doesn't give you the right to kill someone. So you can't argue for choice to kill. Choice is trumped by life every time. Right to life trumps right to choice. That's how it works and how it has to work in our culture. This was like the big thing that, that changed it for her. And I think that's appropriate. I think it should change it for her. I think it should change it for a lot of people who are supporting abortion, thinking that there isn't a living little human that's being killed 
It's a choice to kill. And so we get propaganda from the pro-choice side, and they say things like it. They don't like to refer to the baby as a he or a she, or the term baby. Um, they'll say, you know, fetus or whatever. Um, they like to say terminate instead of kill. We're terminating, or we're removing a pregnancy. We're removing, we're just going to remove a pregnancy here, like to avoid the idea that there's a second individual, living individual being dealt with, or even the term abortion. Like nobody would be pro-choice if it was pro-killing. Like nobody would be that, right? It's, it has to be sloganized to hide the idea that there is a second living human being that's being dealt with, not just a mother. So they say right to choose, but they don't talk about right to choose to kill. No, not that. Um, or that it's about women's rights, but they don't talk about the fact that over 50% of abortions are performed on little tiny women. Or they attach it to feminism, whatever. It's all just distractions from this fact. It's decided by one person, but it's really about two people. All right, let's look at number five. Number five comes from uh, Dominic Colana, who says, when I read a description of a partial birth abortion, this was the thing that blew his mind that really changed his view on the issue. He read a description of a partial birth abortion. Why is this? Because most people, when they think about abortions, they're probably not really aware of what it is they're supporting. They're just thinking, it's just, you know, the baby just goes away. <laughs> you know, just poof, gone, but they don't realize that's not what it is. So what I'm going to do with, with you guys, I'm going to share with you video right now. Now, this is not graphic video of like a gory type of thing. It's cartoonized, okay? But what it is is a descriptive video from a medical doctor just explaining what a procedure of abortion is like, in this case, in the third trimester. I have three of these videos. I think you'll find them interesting, very informative, well done, and tastefully done considering that they, it could be pretty gory stuff if they decided to put up those kinds of images. But it's not. It's very much brought, they, they just way hinder it from being that kind of gore. It's not like that. Um, so this is something I'm hoping everyone is going to be able to um, uh, say, wow, that was that was really well done. That was a really proper presentation on the topic. These videos I'm going to share with you, all three are from liveaction.org. Live Action, they are, um, I'm not sponsored by them. It's going to sound like it in a second here. But what happened was I sent them a, an email and told them what I was doing and asked them permission to share some of their videos. And they, and they gave me permission to share any of their videos I wanted for the, for the pro-life cause. And I was like, that's what I like, you know. Um, so I'm going to share three of their videos because I'm not worried about copyright issues. And the videos are tremendously helpful. So here's the first one. This is what Dominic Kalana found out. This is what changed his mind, why he went from pro-choice to pro-life, because he didn't realize what abortion actually was. My name is Dr. Anthony Levitino. I'm a practicing obstetrician gynecologist, and I've performed over 1,200 abortions. Today, I'm going to describe a third trimester induced abortion, which is performed at 25 weeks to term. At this point, the baby is almost fully developed and viable, meaning he or she could survive outside the womb if the mother were to go into labor prematurely. Because the baby is so large and developed, this procedure takes three or four days to complete. On day one, the abortionist uses a large needle to inject a drug called digoxin. Digoxin is generally used to treat heart problems, but a high enough dosage of digoxin will cause fatal cardiac arrest. The abortionist inserts the needle with the digoxin through the women's abdomen or through her vagina and into the baby, targeting either the head, torso, or heart. The baby will feel it. Babies at this stage feel pain. When the needle pierces the baby's body and the digoxin takes effect, the life of the baby will end. The abortionist then inserts multiple sticks of seaweed called laminaria into the woman's cervix. They will slowly open up the cervix for delivery of a stillborn baby. While the woman waits for the laminaria to dilate her cervix, she carries her dead baby inside of her for two to three days. On day two, the abortionist replaces the laminaria and may perform a second ultrasound to ensure the baby is dead. If the child is still alive, he administers another lethal dose of digoxin. The woman then goes back to where she is staying while her cervix continues to dilate. If she goes into labor and is unable to make it to the clinic in time, she will give birth at home or in a hotel. In this case, she may be advised to deliver her baby into a bathroom toilet. The abortionist then comes to remove the baby and clean up. If she can make it to the clinic, she will do so during her severest contractions and deliver her dead son or daughter. If the baby does not come out whole, 
then the procedure becomes a DNE, a dilation and evacuation. And the abortionist uses clamps and forceps to dismember the baby piece by piece. Once the placenta and all the body parts have been removed, the abortion is complete. Late term abortions have a high risk of hemorrhage, lacerations and uterine perforations, as well as a risk of maternal death. Future pregnancies are also at a greater risk for loss or premature delivery due to abortion-related trauma and injury to the cervix. Okay, I already know. I already know. A lot of people are like, whoa, I did not know that. But some others are watching right now, and I try to sometimes be aware of objectors as I'm teaching, as I'm sharing. I want to be thinking about what objectors might say. And they're thinking, Mike, third term, that's a third term abortion, Mike. You're, you're trying to make it look like all abortions are third term, and that's not at all my case. Rather, what I'm showing you is this. This is Dominic Colana who says, when I read a description of a partial birth abortion, I gave you a much tamer version of abortion than what freaked him out. What freaked him out is a abortion where the baby is partially delivered and then stabbed in the head. It's halfway out of the mom. And because if it comes out all the way, they may legally have to protect this baby. They have to make sure to kill it before it makes its full trip out of the mom. That's what freaked him out. I didn't even show you that. But you should know the more common abortions are also not acceptable. This is a second trimester abortion. It's younger and earlier than the last one that I just showed you. Today I'm going to describe a second trimester surgical abortion called dilatation and evacuation, or DNE. A DNE is performed between 13 and 24 weeks of pregnancy. After administering anesthesia, the abortionist uses a weighted speculum, like this one, that opens the vagina widely. Because second trimester babies are so large, this greater access facilitates a late term abortion. Late term abortion requires that the cervix be prepared 24 to 48 hours in advance with laminaria. Laminaria is a type of sterilized seaweed that absorbs water over eight to 12 hours and swells to several times its original diameter. Once removed, metal dilators can be used to further open the cervix as needed. Once the cervix has been stretched open, the suction tube is placed inside. A baby at 20 weeks gestation is as big as the length of my hand, from head to rump, not counting the legs. The suction machine is turned on, and pale yellow amniotic fluid surrounding the baby is suctioned out through the catheters. But babies this big, they don't fit through catheters this size. The baby's bones and skull are too strong to be torn apart by suction alone. This is a sofa clamp. A sofa clamp is made of stainless steel. It's about 13 inches long. The business end is about two and a half inches long and a half inch wide, and there are rows of sharp teeth. This is a grasping instrument. When it gets a hold of something, it does not let go. The abortionist uses this clamp to grasp an arm or leg. Once he has a firm grip, the abortionist pulls hard in order to tear the limb from the baby's body. One by one, the rest of the limbs are removed, along with the intestines, the spine, and the heart and lungs. Usually the most difficult part of the procedure is extracting the baby's head, which is about the size of a large plum at 20 weeks. The head is grasped and crushed. The abortionist knows he has crushed the skull when a white substance comes out of the cervix. This was the baby's brains. The abortionist then removes skull pieces. He removes the placenta and any leftover parts of the baby with a curette, scraping the lining of the uterus for any remaining tissue. The abortionist then collects the baby parts and reassembles them to make sure that there are two arms, two legs, and all the pieces. Once all the parts have been accounted for, the abortion is complete. For the woman, this procedure carries a significant risk of major complications, including perforation or laceration of the uterus or cervix with possible damage to the bowel, bladder, and other maternal organs. Infection and hemorrhage can also occur, which can even lead to death. Future pregnancies are also at greater risk for loss or premature delivery due to abortion-related trauma and injury to the cervix. Wow. Did you know that? Were you aware of that? You know, even when women are in the office talking about an abortion procedure that are about to happen, it's not abnormal for the people telling them what's going to happen to hide the details. 
to try to use as, as muddy of terminology as possible to try to keep them from understanding what's actually happening. Now, they understandably are worried about the heart of that woman. I don't want you to feel bad. Like, I don't want, this is going to be hard. I don't want you to feel guilty. But, but there's a proper place for feeling bad and guilt. And it's to keep us from doing things like this. And it's for us, after we've done those things, to, to turn to God for forgiveness and be restored and forgiven, but to turn to him, to turn away from those things to him. That's the proper place of guilt. I think our country suffers from a, um, our world, from a lot of mismanaged guilt. Uh, I should do a video on that someday. I think mismanaged guilt is a real problem. Um, but yet you're saying, but Mike, what about the first trimester? What is that? And I think that that's a good question. And that's this this description of the, of the first trimester. And this um, this helps you understand that because we we don't see the baby, there's a belly in the way. We think nothing's going on with an abortion. Or maybe even it, she just took a pill. Just a pill, right? It was just a pill. There was no tools. So nothing's really going on, right? Well, that may not be the case. Today I'm going to describe a first trimester medical abortion. This is a procedure in which the mother swallows pills in order to terminate her baby, and it is performed up to the 10th week of pregnancy. The procedure involves two steps. Step one, at the abortion clinic or doctor's office, the woman takes pills which contain mifepristone, also called RU46. RU46 blocks the action of a hormone called progesterone. Progesterone is naturally produced in the mother's body to stabilize the lining of the uterus. When RU46 blocks progesterone, the lining of the mother's uterus breaks down cutting off blood and nourishment to the baby who then dies inside the mother's womb. It is important to note that even after it has been taken, it is possible to reverse the effects of RU46 and save the baby if progesterone is administered. The sooner, the better. Step two, 24 to 48 hours after taking RU46, the woman takes misoprostol, also called Cytotec, that is administered either orally or vaginally. RU46 and misoprostol together cause severe cramping, contractions, and often heavy bleeding to force the dead baby out of the woman's uterus. The process can be very intense and painful, and the bleeding and contractions can last from a few hours to several days. While she could lose her baby any time and anywhere during this process, the woman will often sit on a toilet as she prepares to expel the child, which she will then flush. She may even see her dead baby within the pregnancy sac. At nine weeks, for example, the baby will be almost an inch long, and if she looks carefully, she might be able to count the fingers and toes. After she has disposed of her baby, the woman may have bleeding and spotting for several weeks. Bleeding lasts, on average, nine to 16 days. 8% of women bleed more than 30 days, and 1% require hospitalization because of heavy bleeding. The failure rate increases as the pregnancy progresses. If failure occurs, she will usually be offered a surgical abortion. For the mother, medical abortion often causes abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, headache, and heavy bleeding. Maternal deaths have occurred, most frequently due to infection and undiagnosed ectopic pregnancy. As I mentioned at the beginning, I'm Dr. Anthony Levitino, and in the early part of my career as an OBGYN, I performed over 1,200 abortions. One day after completing one of those abortions, I looked at the remains of a pre-born child whose life I had ended, and all I could see was someone's son or daughter. I came to realize that killing a baby at any stage of pregnancy for any reason is wrong. I want you to know today, no matter where you're at or what you've done, you can change. Make a decision today to protect the pre-born. Thank you for your time. I will no longer do any more abortions. When you finally figure out, you guys may want to check out this um, this website or uh, uh, liveaction.org. It doesn't take too long to figure out. It doesn't matter if the baby is this big or this. Yeah. Um, now, what I want to uh, what I want to do is uh, move on to the next one. But those those videos are available. You could share them. You could take one of them. You could you could bring it to other people and have them check it out. And there's so much anger on the topic of abortion. Um, I try to divest myself of that stuff as much as possible. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's as bad as it looks. It's as, it's as rough as it sounds. And the issue is something we need to wake our country up to and waking the country up is going to be a, a, about talking about unpleasant things to a lot of people who just would rather not hear it and just go about their day. 
Uh, but let's look at the next one, number six. Um, this is the seeker who replied to my tweet and said, when you realize there's actually a market for dead fetuses, this was the thing he realized, this was the thing that caused his eyes to open up and say, wait a minute, they're, they're selling these baby's body parts? They're, they're making money, millions and millions of dollars off of abortions? I mean, hundreds and hundreds and thousands of abortions every year and they're making massive amounts of money off of these things. And uh, in case you didn't know this, you're like, but wait a minute, let me take Planned Parenthood, for example. Some say Planned Parenthood's only got 3% of their um, of their product is from abortions. I mean, you know, the rest of the stuff that they do, their services are, aren't related to abortion. They're not making their money. It's a, like, it's a small thing. It's a small thing. It's, I mean, by conservative estimates, over 800,000 abortions in the U.S. last year alone. By conservative estimates. Let, let's look at this video, though, and examine the claim. Since I have the ability now to take all of live action's content and just completely steal it and throw it up on my stuff. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna play one more, here it is. America's largest abortion chain, Planned Parenthood, claims over and over and over again that abortion is only 3% of the services that they offer. That's your self-reported abortion statistic. 3% of all the procedures we provide. It's in their annual report. It's on their website. And their supporters say it all the time. And abortions only comprise 3% of Planned Parenthood's health services. Abortion services only account for about 3%. Because only 3% of what Planned Parenthood does is abortions. 3% of patients visit Planned Parenthood for a safe and legal abortion. Here's why that statistic is completely bogus, and why the senior editor of the online magazine Slate said that the 3% stat was the, quote, most meaningless abortion statistic ever, and why the Washington Post fact checker gave Planned Parenthood's 3% statistic three Pinocchios, marking it as, quote, very misleading. Let's look at the numbers. According to their own annual report, Planned Parenthood commits over 300,000 abortions per year. Last year alone, they did 323,999 abortions, which averages to 887 abortions per day, 37 abortions per hour, one abortion every 97 seconds. Again, Planned Parenthood commits one abortion every 97 seconds. But how much of what Planned Parenthood does is abortion? Well, let's divide the number of abortions they do in a year by the number of patients they see in a year. 323,999 abortions for 2.5 million patients means that one in eight patients who walk into Planned Parenthood will undergo an abortion. Not one in 33, Elizabeth Warren, one in eight. It's easy to see where Planned Parenthood's priorities are. They commit 160 abortions for every one adoption referral. Though Planned Parenthood constantly talks about their breast exams and pap tests, they only do less than 1% of the nation's pap tests and 1.8% of the nation's breast exams, while they do 30.6%, a third, of the nation's abortions. But that's a public relations problem. So Planned Parenthood came up with a creative way to make their big business, abortion, look very small. To get the 3% figure, Planned Parenthood divides abortions by the number of so-called services, which they define as a discrete clinical interaction. And they count all these services equally, regardless of the cost, time, or effort it takes to render that service. So an entire abortion procedure, which can cost from $390 to $1,500, is counted the same as a pregnancy test, which a girl could get at a pharmacy for $10. In this way, Planned Parenthood is able to count 9.4 million services. Divide 323,999 abortions by 9.4 million services, and they get 3%. It's easy to see why this math is completely ridiculous. Say a woman goes to Planned Parenthood to get an abortion. She gets her pregnancy test, the abortion procedure, an STI test, and some contraceptives. In one visit, she gets four services, one of which is the actual abortion. So Planned Parenthood would say that abortion was only 25% of what they did for that woman, who came into the clinic only for an abortion. Well, by this math, even if 100% of Planned Parenthood patients got an abortion, they would still say abortion is only 25% of their services. Such distorted calculations could be used to obscure the purpose of any business. It would be like the NFL saying that because they sold 5 million hot dogs in a season and there were only 256 games, football is only 0.005% of what they do. Or it'd be like a steakhouse saying, actually, steak is only a very small percentage of what we serve because we also serve salad, mashed potatoes, french fries, beer, wine, soda, water, butter, salt, pepper, ketchup, toothpicks, and breath mints. We'd say, yeah, right, you're a steakhouse. 
just like Planned Parenthood is an abortion corporation. Yeah. Yeah, liveaction.org. You guys want to check out those videos. There's tons of them. I recommend uh, looking through there. You can even see behind the scenes stuff where they went to Planned Parenthood and recorded, secretly recorded the conversations they had with employees. They're helping uh, helping a pimp uh, to hide his prostitute, you know, being underage. Uh, I mean, there's it's it's atrocious. This stuff's atrocious. It's the Planned Parenthood is, is a cancer. Um, but the abortion issue is bigger than Planned Parenthood. The point here is that there's a market for this stuff. And at least for the seeker, for him, he was like, man, I didn't realize, like, I thought there were just victims that we were protecting. I didn't realize there were a bunch of people making money off of this thing and that they would have an agenda to keep making their money. And so you can look into more of that on your own if you like. Let's look at number seven. We got two more to go. Um, number seven, the real hope. She says, when I was pregnant, I wasn't even a Christian yet. I just knew how hard it was trying to keep the baby alive and couldn't imagine thinking it would be okay for anyone to purposely kill a baby growing inside them. It was just, it was intuitive to her. It was the act of becoming pregnant caused her maternal instincts to kick in and she went, I would do whatever I had to do to keep this baby alive. She obviously had some kind of complications in her pregnancy and she was doing everything she could, everything she could, and that seems to be the right thing to do. I remember one time I was at an abortion clinic and I was one of those hateful, horrible, mean guys who's angry and 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 inconsiderate. And I was standing there with signs and uh, and and trying to talk to people who were walking in and, and just being a real all around pain in the butt. And um, as I was there across the street from us, there was a car accident. And lo and behold, it, in where the car accident was, where that happened, there was a pregnant woman in the car. And so we kind of went over, went over there real quick. I mean, I had had like CPR training and I just thought there's a chance. Plus I was a, I was a police chaplain at the time. And so I thought maybe there's something I can do to help here. So I went over and the woman comes out of the car and I realized she's pregnant and we're all worried, you know, did the seatbelt smash on her belly or did anything weird happen? Is she okay? Is she, is she all right? We're just concerned about her. She was obviously very pregnant and she seemed to be fine. And we were relieved. We were relieved. And the irony of the moment struck me here on one side of the street was a woman, everyone's worried about the, the, the baby. The most important thing to us in that accident was the baby, right? More than anybody else, we were worried about that baby. Not the cars, not the people, the baby. Across the street, people were killing their babies. The irony of the moment, the dark, sad irony of the moment. Um, wow, wow. You know, in our culture, we, we realize this, we see this, our hypocrisy comes out when we say that if a man kills a pregnant woman and then the baby dies and the woman dies, we, we say he should be charged with double homicide. He killed two people. It was, a, it was two murders that went on there. This is like a natural gut reaction. Yeah, of course, this is obviously true. But, but then you can go and you can kill that baby um, and it's okay. It's okay. So th this this whole idea, the real hope is just pointing out the obvious, the obvious hypocrisy when we see our value for life transferred onto a baby, it gets higher, not lower, and how others want to actually terminate that life. Last reason, excuse me, the last reasons from Logos Apologetics, who said, I realize basically all the pro-choice arguments apply to a baby when it's one year old, as well as inside the womb. Now this, slow down and take this in. Because this is about this is this isn't just about like gut level moral reasoning, which is healthy. We should have gut level moral reasoning, but this is this is about like thoughtful argumentation. Like, hmm, I actually tried to weigh the arguments for killing a baby, and as I weighed them out, I realized that the arguments for killing an, a baby in the womb would all apply to a one year old. Wait a minute, but I know it's wrong to kill a one year old. You you can't justify killing. One person, if that same justification would let you kill someone else, and we all agree that that's wrong. Let me give you an example of this. And this comes from a video I did a while ago um, um, where we use the SLED argument, S-L-E-D. S-L-E-D, SLED. Now, the, the word SLED's an acronym to describe what's different about an infant in the womb or a preborn baby versus a postborn baby. What's the difference between them? Well, the only differences are size, level of development, um, the E is uh, environment, and then D is degree of dependency. Size, level of development, environment, degree of dependency. Now, you can't kill people based on their size. So it doesn't make sense to say, well, but, the, but in the womb, the baby's very small. <laughs> like, but a one-year-old's also really small compared, I mean, I'm six feet tall now, 
when I was one year old, I was really small. Or how about 20 minutes after I was born, I was tiny. Why was it? So does, does my size make me more valuable? Are, are smaller people less valuable? That doesn't make any sense. It seems like human value is either an on off or off thing. It's you have it or you don't. How can you have it in degrees like that? And how can size be the thing that gives you the degree? Or, or is it level of development? Level of development. Okay, well, um, you know, a, a baby in the womb, it doesn't have the, the brain functioning, you know, fully yet. It doesn't have uh, the fully cent full central nervous system in place at this whatever stage you want to pick arbitrarily of the development. Uh, blood's not pumping yet. It's, it's, it's 18 days instead of 21. So there's no blood yet. Um, that, you know, that these are arbitrary things, but you just throw them out there and say, well, there's different level of development. But I could say, well, a one-year-old doesn't have a real functioning brain, doesn't even have a fully developed frontal lobe, won't for like 20-something years, by the way, right? That's, that, you remember when you got really smart all of a sudden when you were like 25 and you were like, whoa, it's like I understand life all of a sudden, you know? <laughs> it was because your brain got done and, uh, and then it starts degrading after that pretty much. But, uh, but yeah, so there's, there's the, the brain, okay, but a one-year-old has a completely underdeveloped brain, the completely underdeveloped uh, reproductive system, you know, uh, basically then we could say that there's less human rights for anyone under, under puberty because they're, they're not developed enough. Okay, but that's a problem. And then as people age, it's like they um, re regress in a sense. I mean, they lose the development features. And so we could see someone who's not as mentally astute, who's physically disabled, their level of development is now degrading. We don't think we can kill them now. So in a rational evaluation, size doesn't work. Level of development doesn't work. You, you, would, you would have to say that we can kill lots of people other than just abortions. Um, environment doesn't work. I mean, is there is there something that's different about the trip from, you know, in the mother's womb to out of the mother that that gives you human rights? Think about this for a second. You're telling me that if I'm, 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 you know, eight months from conception and I'm in the womb, I have no rights. But, but in the, in the room next to me, there's a woman who just gave birth. She gave birth prematurely. Their child's eight months old, just like me, but that one has human rights. That doesn't make any sense. Environment or location can't give me human rights. It doesn't make any sense, guys. This is silly. And the final one, degree of dependency. Degree of dependency. Let's say, well, the baby's dependent on the mother. He, you know, the child's using the mother in the womb, is using the mother's organs and body systems and stuff to develop. And I would say, yes, but this is natural. This isn't like an, like an abuse. Someone on Twitter said that um, forcing a woman to continue in a, a, a pregnancy is slavery. Slavery. Well, I mean, in a sense, motherhood is slavery. That's just, they like, face it, right? But, but not in reality. Like, this isn't actual, this is rather natural, a natural and proper dependency that children have on their parents, right? And, and it happens in the womb. And guess what? It happens outside the womb. A one-year-old will not survive unless the parents use their organs to help that baby. So you, but you can't leave the child of, to die of exposure because you just don't feel like using your organs to deal with the baby. That doesn't make any sense. So size, level of development, environment, degree of dependency, if you want to have a rational evaluation of the morality of, of, of why you might justify killing the preborn, then all the reasons you can give fall short because most of them can be used to kill a one-year-old as well. Um, just about all of them except for uh, environment. But then you're, you're basically saying the only way to make environment work is by saying that uh, in the womb is the only place where humans have no rights. Everywhere else we're at, now we have rights. That's called moral depravity to say a thing like that. If you don't see it, um, I don't know how to make you see it. You got issues. And so uh, those are the eight reasons. And I want to tell you why I did this. Before I go to your guys' questions, because I have I already have a bunch lined up. Why I did this video. Because sometimes what should change your mind doesn't change your mind. Like I can offer reasons to change your mind on abortion, but I don't know what's actually going to land. Like what is going to actually make a difference to you personally? And my thought was by asking normal, real people what actually changed your mind and then just putting those reasons in front of everybody that it would find more normal people and change their minds. Yeah, you should change your mind on this issue. It's not a women's rights issue. That's a deception, right? This is a human rights issue. Human rights, that's what it's about. And so I hope it changes your mind um, because, wow, what have we done? What have we done as a nation? What have we done as a people? What have we supported? And if you and if that hits you, if you're like, what have I done? I did. I, I had an abortion. I had several abortions. How can I even look myself in the face? I mean, but look at that doctor who was just up there. He committed 12, over 1,200 abortions, and now who, what's he doing? He's fighting for the pro-life cause. Now he's making a difference. 
Hopefully he came to Christ and he found forgiveness for his sin because Jesus didn't ju just die for people who have issues. He died for sinners. He paid the price. Like his death was the price fully paid for the sin that you committed. And so I'm extending to you not only the awareness of, of the issue of the sin, but also I want to extend to you the grace and the love of God through Jesus Christ. That you put your faith and your trust in him who died for you because he loved you so much. And there's the forgiveness. Don't try to hide from the guilt and try to justify it. Instead, just take it to the cross and let him wash you clean. Um, all right, Anna Boshir has a question. Anna says, uh, hi, Pastor Mike. Hi, Anna. Wondering what your take is on vaccines. Um, I'll, I'll preface this by saying, I don't know that much about vaccines, Anna. I, so I don't want to comment as though I do, but I'll read your question here. Considering some vaccines contain cells from aborted babies, which is the biggest issue, but all vaccines contain disease, proven neurotoxins in animal blood and DNA. Um, Job 14.4 is the verse you offer me here, and I'll look it up. Based on scripture, I can't see anything backing vaccines, only against. Christians can never give straight give a straight answer when I show them the evidence. Job 14.4. Ah, okay, let's see here. Uh, I want to bring you guys back to the text, and there it is. Uh, Job 14.4 says, Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? There is not one. There is not one. Um... Let's see, what is the context of this pa of this passage here? So it's, Job is the one speaking, and he says, a man who was born of a woman is few of days and full of trouble. He comes out like a flower and withers. He flees like a shadow and continues not. And do you not, and do you open your eyes on such a one and bring him, uh, and bring me into judgment with you? Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean thing? There is not one. And so it, it seems to me that what Job is saying is that he's, he's sort of like doomed from birth. He's born as an unclean thing. And the act of, of, of birth, especially in the Jewish context, and there's a debate on whether Job had, had the law of Moses and stuff or not, like what, where, you, where you date him. But in the Jewish context, giving it that context I'll, for discussion, he, um, the act of birth was a, a, a bloody act, is a bloody act, right? So it would have ceremonial uncleanness. And so he, I feel like he's saying like I was sort of like doomed to start with. Now here's here's my con my concern. Um, I don't think this passage applies to vaccines. I'm not I'm not answering the vaccine question. I'm saying I don't think this passage applies to vaccines for a few reasons. The unclean thing it seems in the passage is Job himself, and Jesus does make us clean, and he does bring an a, an unclean thing into cleanness. And Job is is complaining and griping a lot here. And later in the book, he's like, what a what a fool I was. So I don't want to form too much doctrine off of what Job says without carefully evaluating what he says. Um, so he doesn't say um, no one, including God, can bring a clean thing out of an unclean thing. Um, Jesus was certainly born of a virgin and he was clean, you know, right? He was clean throughout. So I would say that the Bible seems to be telling Job, ha, there is one who can do this and it's God. But I think it has nothing to do with vaccines. Um, that would be, that's my short exegesis on the passage. I think it has nothing to do with vaccines. Um, vaccines themselves, if, if it's something that's being uh, using aborted babies, then I think it would be morally wrong. If it's not, if it's the other question on vaccines about are they healthy, are they hurtful, is it some kind of conspiracy going on, um, I'm not convinced that they are, but I'm not weighing in on this because I have not done my homework on it. I just think that's a separate question. So I would, I would isolate all these questions. Does the Bible say something about vaccines? Not to my knowledge. Does uh, ba aborted babies, baby fetuses being used in vaccines mean you shouldn't use them? I think morally, yes, that seems easy. Are there other reasons to not have vaccines? Um, well, I will start a flame war if I say yes or no here, but uh, but I'm not, I think that's unrelated to the abortion question. All right, so GD says, uh, what do I tell my father who thinks that it's illogical for a guy like me to wait till marriage to have sex? He thinks since I already lost my virginity, there's no point. Um, yeah, you know what? I met students as a youth pastor. I met lots of students who felt this way who felt, even before it's just having friends, right? Who felt like, well, I already blew it. You know, I already lost my virginity. And therefore, what's the point? I may as well just have sex, whatever. And um, could you imagine, though, um, applying that principle to other rules in life, other things in life? Like, I already stole one car. Like, what's the point in not stealing cars for the rest of my life? Well, I'm just going to go ahead and steal cars. Or I already committed adultery once. Well, what's the point in, in staying faithful now? Like I've already broken the faithfulness thing. And so I'm just going to go ahead and go for it. And this is the, the problem here is that we're thinking of, of sexual purity as something you have um, until you break it and then it's broken and it's, it's over. 
Like it, it's over. After you lost your virginity, it's now over. But yet there is still intended to be sexual faithfulness even after sexual failings. And there is still intended to be a um, an, an obedience even after a failure. And that's that's the whole point. It's like, hey, just because I blew it, that doesn't mean blow it again. That's all. That's all that, I mean, that's the easiest answer. Your father thinks it's illogical for you to wait to have sex. Well, I mean, I, I had family that thought all sorts of weird things that I was going to stay pure until marriage. They thought it was weird. They wondered about me. <laughs> and, uh, because it's weird to them that you're following Jesus in these areas in your life. I say just, just patiently seek the Lord, obey God, follow him, focus on having a godly relationship, focus on, on having godly principles and behaviors in your marriage. Right, not not only staying sexually pure, but having also godly principles like how you talk to her, how how you respect her, how you treat each other, that you have a biblical marriage, and if you do that, one day your dad will look back and be like, "Wow, I don't know why, but that's working for some reason," and hopefully that will be a testimony to him. I can say it is to my family um, when they look and they're like, "Well, some, for some reason his life's working out. That's kind of weird, I guess, because he has all these weird rules." Um, yeah, Toby Noble says. Part one. <laughs> That's, he probably put two comments and they were joined by uh, by my mod, Sarah. Um, Toby Noble says, I've seen other apologetics, other, oh, I've seen another apologetic who is under the impression that God did not create the universe but only gave an already existing universe its function and took it out of a chaos. Also that God did not create Adam and Eve but gave them purpose, told them to marry and be functional as a couple and more odd ideas, theistic evolution. I've seen this apologetic labeled as a Christian apologetic, but don't most theistic evolution ideas completely contradict most of Genesis alone? Not to mention more. Thanks. Okay, let me, I'm just in my head as I read these questions, sometimes I try to like pull them into categories because often the questions are complicated. There's like layers of issues. So well, let me talk about, um, uh, first off, I think you're talking about inspiring philosophy. Uh, because I was, I was looking at some of his content recently on Genesis and and um, seeing some of the stuff he's he's done on it, and I'm not I'm not okay. I, I admit I'm not on board with his interpretation exactly, uh, but here's the thing: uh, Michael Jones, inspiring philosophy. He's a brother in Christ. He's my brother in, in Christ, and he's trying to defend the Scripture best way he knows how. When it comes to Genesis, I have more questions than answers when it comes to the opening chapters of Genesis. Um, when it comes to specifically how they're properly ought to be interpreted, because I found that some of the young earth creationist views that I was raised with, they they weren't answering some of the other thoughtful looks at Genesis. And so it kind of put me a little bit on the fence right now. I'm like, I'm not really sure what my view is. And I don't mean here that, um, oh, Mike's, Mike's uh, going to change his view on Genesis because he's being pressured by modern science or something like that. I'm actually, I think of these as two separate questions. We have the text question and we have the science question. What does the text say? That's a separate question, right? The other question, okay, what about the science, what about you know the age of the earth and, and fossil evidence and all those kinds of things? Separate question. The question I have more interest in is what does the text say? And long story short, I think there's more of a case that can be made for views other than young earth creationism than what I thought in the past. But I don't know what my view is on this and I don't like stepping into areas where I'm unconvinced and I'm not sure what to think. And so for that, I say, yeah, like IP, he's doing he's doing what he can. I don't have a perfect evaluation of his content because it's just some of it's just kind of over my head. Um, but uh, at, at least for the moment. Um, but that being said, I, I know his view. Uh, he's not saying, I think, if I understand him right, he's not saying that God didn't create the whole universe out of nothing. He's not saying that. He's he's asking about specifically the phrase in Genesis, um, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, that that may refer to not just the moment God created everything, but his ordering of everything. Um, I think we would still argue, probably he would too, from the book of Hebrews, that the Bible does clearly say God creates the universe out of nothing, ex nihilo. He's just not using Genesis to do that. He will do it in another passage. I think that might be his view. I could be completely wrong. Please take my hesitance as indication that you need to find out on your own uh, what those views are. Um, okay, as far as the function view, no, I'm not personally convinced. I think it seems a little bit weird to me, the, the, the assigning functions view of Genesis, for those who are familiar with it. Uh, John Walton pioneers this view, and I know Michael Jones really is a big fan of Walton, but I haven't done all my homework to be able to speak authoritatively on it or, or even super convinced. I'm just, what little I've done says, I don't really care too much for that. Um, and so, yeah, is it Christian? Well, it, it, it may or may not be accurate, but it's, it's Christian. I mean, he, they're holding to the essentials of the Christian faith 
absolutely are. I believe they are. So I don't think this is an in-house debate amongst Christians here. This is not um, young earth creationism versus the world. There is a in-house discussion about the book of Genesis that needs to continue taking place until we can all get more clarity on this stuff. Currently, um, a lot of you are like me and you're going, hmm, I'm interested. I believe scripture. No compromise there. I believe God's word is correct. No compromise there. But if you can show me good hermeneutical reasons to consider your, your interpretation, I'll listen. All right, there you go. If I didn't confuse you, we'll move on. Uh, Slavic Striz says, uh, hey, Mike, what do you think of this virus that's spreading all over? Are you prepared for the shortage or of food that the WHO is w warning the U.S. to prepare for? Uh, the World Health, Health Organization? I don't even know about that. I'm kind of clueless. Um, what do I think about it? I, I, I haven't been looking that much into it. What little I've looked into it, it, it sounds confusing to me. Uh, I hear numbers coming out of China that sound like they're a lot lower than I would expect them to be. But then I hear that what I've heard is that they closed like Disneyland in Hong Kong. They like closed it and, and, and all the businesses have been shut down. And I know someone from China who's who left when this thing first started and they're getting reports from their family that things are all shut down and that it's like. So on one hand, it sounds it just sounds confusing. It's like, what's really going on? I don't know. Um, and I don't intend to do all the work to find out. Um, I just refuse to leave my house for the next three months. And uh, so if someone could send me some food, that'd be nice. Josie J says, some Christians say that if couples want to live by faith, they should have as many children as possible. How would you respond to that? Josie, I I, uh, I don't think that there's any command that you have to have as many children as possible. Um, how we take be fruitful and multiply, there's a couple different ways to look at that. And uh, I, don't, I don't know for sure how much of a mandate it is for every couple to have as many kids as possible. There is re refutation in scripture for the idea of trying to rob a woman who's trying to have a child, trying to keep her from doing that. Uh, Onan, who God kills because he's trying to do that. Because, But it's not just that he's not trying to have as many kids as possible. I don't personally think there's anything wrong with family planning to at least some degree. Um, then the question is to what degree? To what degree do you do that? Uh, that I, I'm not I'm not 100% sure that there's a rule I could dump on everybody else. Eddie Vasquez says, if a baby is killed in the womb or shortly after, what kind of body will it have in heaven? Um, well, I, I my thought, Eddie, is that we're probably all going to have um, glorified bodies that are fully mature. Um, this is my impression that we're going to have that. I mean, if if I died at 14, am I stuck in a 14-year-old body? Well, what what is a 14-year-old glorified body? The glorified body doesn't seem to age, so it seems like it's just, there's some kind of static or um, not static in the complete sense, but... Uh, Un, non-decaying form that we will have in our glorified bodies. And 1 Corinthians 15 talks about this. You know, the, our corruption must put on incorruption. The mortal must put on immortality. Um, if you're 90 years old and you die of old age, I don't think you're going to be resurrected into a 90-year-old, old, decrepit body. So I, my, my thought is that because I think old people will probably be younger, I would probably think young people would be older, with at least physically. Um, if you could call that older with a glorified body, I mean, what, what's age with a glorified body anyway? Uh, big Gucci Sosa Baby says, the big question I have struggled with is there any circumstances that it is biblically right for abortion, for example, rape or life of the mother at stake? Um, I don't think rape is a, is a legitimate example because we don't have any justification to kill the, the child that was the result of a rape. Like, let's say it's a, a six-month-old baby and you find out this has been the result of a rape and the woman's like, I'm so traumatized. I can't even look at this baby. It looks like that guy that raped me. And so she's like, can I kill it? I mean, the answer is obviously no. Obviously no. You can adopt the child or you can just go to counseling and try to try to process through this horrible trauma you've been through. But you're not allowed to kill the baby. That's not okay. The same is true for the one in the womb. Rape is in crazy tough situation. It just doesn't justify killing someone who wasn't the rapist. Uh, now, if you want to talk about whether we should kill the rapist, that's a whole other conversation. I'm, I'm a lot more interested in that. Um, but uh, but yeah. Now, the other question you asked about the, the life of the mother, I think in principle, this seems easy. Because if a mother is going to die while carrying this baby, the first option is to do a C-section or delivery and get that baby out of the mother. Now you've saved both of them. Okay, you've saved both of them. Now, on the other hand, if the if the baby's not viable, there's no viability in the baby. You 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 can't deliver the baby, or you can't the mom can't go through that for whatever reason. Then the result is you're going to lose two lives, right? Because mom's going to die and baby's going to die. 
well, I'm pro-life, right? I want to save as many lives as possible. This is this rare exception where I would say, yes, I think abortion, this is the one and only time that it would be justified. Now, here's another debate that comes up. Is that scenario ever going to really happen in real life? And the pro-choice people, I've heard them say it happens all the time. But I've heard a couple doctors who are pro-life, but they're doctors who say, dude, this never really happens. This just doesn't happen. So I think a pro-choice person could say, in principle, that would be the one exception. But in practicality, that may never really happen. But if it did, I would I would be okay with it. Um, it wouldn't be easy. It'd be tough. But that'd be my that'd be my understanding of it. And most pro-life people I've talked to, they have the same view on this issue. And then debate about whether it ever does happen or not. Uh, Drexler Newball says, how do you respond to people that say the, the phrase this generation in the Olivet Discourse is always used to address the people directly speaking to, uh, therefore it cannot mean a future generation. Um, I, I think if they say that, I want to see them prove it. Like whenever someone says this generation has to always mean this, you know, that's a pretty big burden. They, they have, they can. I show them any example of the phrase this generation and they have to show me it always means that. And not just in the text of scripture. I would want to see outside scripture too. So um, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to see them prove it first. I don't think that's the case though. And I have a video on, uh, was Jesus a failed apocalyptic prophet or something like that? Was Jesus a failed prophet? Where I go through the Olivet Discourse and talk about this very issue. You might want to check that out. Maybe one of the mods could drop that in the live chat if you have a chance. Uh, I'm just saying, says, how many pro-choice persons are animal rights activists that would protest if veterinarians made abortion a normal practice for dogs, cats, horses, rabbits, mice, monkeys, etc.? I wonder. That'd be a really interesting poll, is to just go out and do a poll. Hey, are you pro-choice? Um, where, where do you draw the line, if they draw the line anywhere? And then ask them, um, do you think it's okay to abort a dog's babies? you know, or a monkey's babies or a rabbit's babies. Do you think that that's, that's okay? Or, you know, you know, are you vegan? Are you vegan? It's like, it's, I, I won't eat meat. I won't eat any animal product, but abortion's okay. Because these, these are inconsistent views. That'd be interesting to look at. Uh, Michael Berub says, can you do a video on pneumatology soon? It's something I feel is heavily misunderstood, misrepresented in a lot of churches today. Thanks for your videos. They're a huge blessing. I'll, I'll consider it, Michael. I'm really loaded up right now at the moment though, with a bunch of plans. Um, so pneumatology is, is the theology about the Holy Spirit, right? Pneuma spirit. So it's about the Holy Spirit, or it could be about, I guess you could be our spirits. You could talk about it as well. Um, let's see. Robert John Bagsick says, any option using contraceptives? I, I think the question about contraceptives, contraceptives is, are they abortifacient? Meaning, do they cause an abortion or do they prevent conception? Preventing conception, I don't personally see this moral... It's a different, let me first say this, it's a different moral question than abortion. Preventing conception is not the same as abortion, right? A couple, when they know that they are, um, when they know that the woman's fertile and they're not, they don't sleep together that night, they're preventing conception, aren't they? I mean, so that's not the same as having an abortion. Um, but the question is, is it having an abortion? And I think that we would, anybody who's going to use any kind of abortion or excuse me, birth control related material or contraceptives, they need to do their research and make sure that they know what's happening chemically because even doctors will sometimes muddy the waters and not tell you what's really up. Cowboy Zeke says, where can I get those videos? Cowboy Zeke, you can get them on liveaction.org. That's where I got all the videos I share with you guys today. Liveaction.org, great site. And I pinned a link to it in the video description, or excuse me, in the first comment on this video on YouTube. Uh, followers of G Follower of Jesus says, hi Mike, what's your view on Luke 14.33 and Luke 12.33? Hmm... Um, Luke 14, 33, it says, so therefore any of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. And then, um, Luke 12, 33, he says, sell your possessions, give to the needy, provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old with the treasure in the heavens that does not fail where no thief approaches and no moth destroys for where your treasure is there will your heart be also. Um, <clears throat> I think that, um, uh, boom, back to the home page. I think that Jesus gives us here, um, how do I put this? Hy hyperbolic examples of what it means to follow him, entirely and completely follow him. But do we see, for instance, in the New Testament, one way to check this is faithful followers of Jesus, were they all 
poor with no money because they gave away all their money. Um, well, no, we have like Lydia, who's a seller of purple, who continues her business after becoming a Christian. And out of the funds of her business, she supports missionaries. We actually see a few women who do this. Um, so this this sort of thing was going on in the early church. If, if, if that was like a regular principle or rule for everybody, I would expect to see it consistently followed. Rather, if it, however, is an extreme example of Jesus, like when he says, you have to hate your father and mother. If you want to come after me, hate your father and mother. You want to come after me, sell all that you have, you know, those types of things. I think what he's doing here is he's, he's taking our attention and he's saying, what I want you to do is, and here's my application, is your whole life, every penny in your bank account, every day, every moment, all that you would love, all that you are, it's for me now. It belongs to me now. It's seeking first my kingdom and my righteousness, and I will take care of you and those other things. But rather, I, I do think there's Christians who are called to be businessmen, who are called to do well. But the question is, does your money belong to Jesus? Or is it just a percentage of it, you know? Um, all right. Um, running towards the end here for tonight, um, Hannah Mar uh, Hannah Mabry says, are morning after pills not also a, <clears throat> a form of abortion? Yeah, they definitely are. A morning after pill would be a form of abortion. Um, and uh, we're going to, we're, we're going to, and you can look at that as more on your own, um, but it, it is for sure. Uh, now the, the thing I just, last thing from Sarah Zimmerman, she says, people are complaining because there was no cat cam today. Well, there was no cat today. The cat was, sometimes she hangs out up on top of the bookcase there and she's not anymore. She came down though. She's in her spot. If you'll give me a moment, I'll bring my, my little webcam over and I'll point it at my cat for you all. Because this is really the most important thing. So just a moment. Here it comes. The cat cam. <laughs> Device is not available. I probably should plug it in. Yeah, I didn't plug it in. One second. This is really, this is what it's all about, guys. This... This is what Bible Thinker Ministry is really about. The cat cam. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so sometimes she sits next to me, sometimes she doesn't. That's that's kind of how it works. There you are. All right, well, I hope you have a really, guys, a really great night, y'all. Um, I, I encourage you to be not only changing your mind from pro-choice to pro-life, but, but mobilize yourself. Go do something about it. If you think this precious little cute little cat has value, right? Yeah. If you think this cat has value, and so do babies and more, and it's good for us to do something about it, change the world, and you can. You change one person, you may have just saved a life. So let's let's mobilize Let's make people a little more uncomfortable about the topic so they can get right with the Lord on it. God bless you. Thanks for joining me.